Well, good morning and welcome to River City Church Online. So glad to have you join us today. The sun is poking through more and more. In fact, it's only 42 days until spring. This is great news. And things are looking up with the pandemic, with the vaccine. So these are exciting times. We've got exciting times with River City Church as well. And so there are some announcements coming up at the end of today's service that you'll want to listen into. James Carroll is back to share a little bit about our finances. Plus, I have some events that came out of our forum for engagement that was held a couple weeks ago on Zoom. So some events from the past that have been reinvented and put online. I'm going to share those at the end of today's service. All right, Daryl's going to be taking us one step further with being rooted and built up today. And it's about maturity in Christ. If you've had a great week, like a strong week, you'll be like, yes, bring it on. If you've had a week that hasn't shown your best traits or such, you might be a little apprehensive. But my word for you is that God's grace is good enough for all of us and it is sufficient. And so you and I can press in and get rooted and built up, whatever that means for us today. In a moment, Sean's gonna take us into worship, but for now, I just wanna address anybody here that's listening in who's brand new with us today. We're so glad you came, and we just want you to know that we are a come as you are kind of church. If you're just wondering what it would be like to visit us in person. We would be loving you no matter how you came. We would be just so glad that you came today and wanted to learn more about God. So thank you for joining us. If you want to contact us, go to our website and you can go onto the menu bar and click contact us and just share how you came across us online. We'd love to connect with you and get to know more about you. Have a good morning with us. And for now, I'm going to let you go into worship with Sean. Talk to you later. Well, good morning, River City. Um, I got to admit, I'm a little bit envious of Melissa's video, uh, given that she got to film outside when it was sunny and the weather was above zero. Uh, and I decided to wait another day and I got this. But that's kind of life in Canada, isn't it? I mean, one day it's sunny and the temperature is warm and then the next day it's windy and snowing and cold. And in reality, that's actually kind of like life in general. Things can be going really, really well one day and then seemingly overnight a storm comes in and we feel buried. But what do you do when the storms come? Now, there's lots of things that we can do when storms come. Some of them are helpful, some are not. But the Bible tells us that there's one thing that we actually should do when storms come, and probably most of us don't do it. And it's not what you're probably thinking. You're probably thinking, pray, right? And yes, that's a good thing, but it's actually not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is where the Bible says to be still. Specifically, God tells us to be still and know that I am God. And that comes from Psalm 46, verse 10. And specifically, that psalm starts with the phrase, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. So this morning, let's take a few minutes to be still and know that the Lord is God. He is our refuge, our strength, and our help in times of trouble.
could ever come close No thing can compare You're our living hope Your presence, Lord I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of comes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the Your 
Hey River City, I want to thank you for making this part of your day. If you haven't figured it out, I am standing at home in my kitchen and uh, next to me I have two common household appliances. On my left, this white object is a microwave oven and on my right, this uh, black and silver uh, object is a crock pot, also called a slow cooker. And what's interesting is both of these appliances became common in households in the 1970s. The microwave more toward the end of the 70s and the crock pot in the early 70s. Now both of these appliances are used in food preparation. They're used to heat and even to cook food. But the way that they heat food is drastically different. So let's start with the microwave oven. Uh, if I open my microwave oven and I put something into it, I've got uh, a pat of butter here and I put this into the microwave to cook it. You uh, set your time here on the, the side of the microwave and, and usually when you're cooking with a microwave, you're, you're cooking in seconds and, and maybe minutes, but, but that's about the length of it. It tends to be a, a shorter amount of time because a microwave oven uh, uses electromagnetic stimulation uh, to heat particles up and it cooks food very quickly. So I'll give you an example here. Just run this for a few seconds. Now when this appliance is working, you can tell because it emanates this ominous hum. There's this light inside of it and uh, it doesn't take long until you can see that the butter is starting to melt, right? It works very, very quickly. Now, on the flip side, this crock pot uh, is very different. If I, again, using a pat of butter, like this one, if I put the butter into the crock pot, I already know that it's gonna cook very differently because when I go to set the time, it has different settings, but the shortest or the shortest amount of time that I can cook for on this one is 30 minutes. So we're not talking seconds or even minutes. Uh, a crock pot cooks in 30 minute uh, blocks of time. And uh, I've set it for 30 minutes here and I'm not gonna lift it up for you, but uh, the butter isn't moving. It's been in longer than the 10 seconds I did it in the microwave for. And uh, this ceramic pot on the outside ring of the, um, crock pot, this is the ring that gets heated up and then the food that's inside of it cooks because of the heat in the ceramic pot. But you can tell it's not even hot. Uh, it's been going for you know several seconds already and it's actually a considerable length of time before you can tell that a crock pot is even working. The only indicator that it's working would be the light uh, on the front. You can tell that it's been set. Now, no, I didn't get hired by the cooking channel, and this is not a cooking lesson. Um, this is still River City Church. There's a reason that I'm introducing you to these two appliances today, and the reason is this. It's because I believe that this appliance, this microwave oven, better represents how things operate in this world today and better represents how we've come to expect things to operate. Put differently, we live in a microwave world. We live in a microwave world where we've come to expect your way right away. We've come to expect things instantly or we've come to expect things quick and easy. Uh, if we have a question, what do we do? We go to the internet, we do a Google search, and in 0.63 seconds, so not even one second, we have 10 million answers to our question. Or we can simplify by asking Siri. Uh, or if we are lacking something that we want uh, in our house, maybe during pandemic, all we have to do is go on the internet and place an order on Amazon. Within seconds, we get confirmation that our order has been placed. Within Minutes, maybe hours, we get confirmation that that object has been sent. And within a day, it appears at our front door, like presto. So you get what I mean when I say it's a microwave world where we've come to expect things to be quick and things to be easy. And yet, 
in spite of all this modern technology and in spite of how we humans have supposedly evolved, some things in life, some of the best things and arguably important things, do not come quickly or easily. Like what I want to talk to you about this morning. Now, before I tell you what I want to talk to you about this morning, um, I want to emphasize this. That... Um, when it comes to what we're going to talk about today, this appliance, this crock pot here, is a much better representation of how today's topic works. So what is it? So today's topic in our series on Colossians is the topic of maturity or uh, Christian maturity or spiritual maturity. The Apostle Paul, in no uncertain terms, declares that his goal is to see and to help the Colossian Christians to reach full and complete maturity in Christ Jesus. And he lays this out right at the end of the opening chapter of his letter, in chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. He says that we, and when he refers to we, those of you who have been following this series know that we refers to Paul and his apprentice leader, Timothy, and we, what's our purpose? What's our goal? That we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And then the question might be, well, how committed was Paul to this goal? Verse 29, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. If you're viewing the screen, you'll see that I've underlined two phrases in that scripture quote. The first phrase that's underlined is the phrase fully mature. And that comes from the Greek word teleos. And uh, uh, teleos gets translated in various ways. Uh, probably the best definition is the word complete. Some translations have perfect or perfected, which really isn't as accurate because that connotes the idea of flawlessness and it's more the idea of having reached the intended goal or outcome. I'll give you an illustration. Here in Cambridge, uh, one of the biggest employers is Toyota, Toyota Automobile Manufacturing, and they have a, a, an assembly plant here in Cambridge. Some of our uh, members work there, a number of our members work there, and uh, a Toyota in that plant can said to be tilios, right, complete, when it's gone through the entire assembly process and it comes out of the plant and it's ready to be loaded onto the train or to the truck so that the car can go to the customer. That's the picture here. That's what full maturity in Christ is all about, tilios. The second underlined phrase on your screen is the phrase strenuously contend. And it's from a Greek word, agonizomai. And if you were listening to how I pronounce that, it has kind of like uh, a hint of the English word agonize, right? Agonizomai. And it's similar to agonize in that you're, you're, you're struggling uh, to... to Struggle in the sense of an athlete struggling to win a competition uh, the way that the Chiefs and the Buccaneers today will be struggling uh, to win uh, this year's Super Bowl, right? Uh, we're talking full focus and all-out effort. I mean, this is to struggle with all one's might and with all one's person. So Paul not only states that his goal is full maturity in Christ... But he also goes on to express his own commitment to helping the Colossian Christians to achieve that goal. And get this, Paul is 100% committed to this. He's giving his full focus, he's giving his all-out effort to helping these believers reach this goal of full and complete maturity in Christ. So given that Paul is like 100% committed to this goal of, of, of helping and assisting these believers, the question would be, how committed should these believers be to their own spiritual maturity, to their own completeness in Christ? Well, think of it this way. Should 
the athletes on a team be any less committed to the goal of victory than the captain or the coach? And I trust that you, you would say, no, the answer is, of, of course not. The athletes need to be every bit as committed as the coach is, right? Um, meaning that the Colossian Christians were to strenuously contend as well. Uh, they were to make spiritual maturity in Christ their full focus, and they were to give it their best efforts as well. Question. Does all this language that you've been hearing in these opening two verses of today's passage, does this suggest that what we're talking about today is a non-essential, or is this an essential? Non-essential or essential? Well, I trust that you're all going to agree that we're talking about something absolutely essential. Essential, not just for the Colossian Christians, but for every Christ follower, including any of us who identify as followers of Christ today. We're to grow up in Christ until we become like Christ in every way. That's what completeness in Christ looks like. Now, given who Jesus is and what we've learned about Jesus from the four Gospels, we've got to recognize that this is going to be a lifelong goal, right? None of us is going to arrive. We're going to always have room for growth when it comes to becoming more and more like Christ. So, going back to the opening introduction of the microwave and the slow cooker, what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual growth, when we talk about maturity, is we're talking about a slow process that really extends from the moment you become a believer until the moment either Jesus returns or he calls you home. We're talking about a lifelong goal. Next question. Do you see this as being the goal of most Christians that you come into contact with today? This complete maturity, this full maturity in Jesus Christ? Would you say that's the lifelong goal of most Christians that you know? Or make it personal. Has this been your goal if you're a Christ follower? Is how NFL players train to win Super Bowls, how you train to attain full maturity in Jesus Christ? The tough question, right? And maybe it hasn't been your goal. Maybe it hasn't been your goal because you didn't know it was supposed to be your goal. Well, guess what? Now you do. Or maybe it hasn't been your goal, though you knew it was to be your goal, because you've been intimidated, because we're talking about a pretty serious goal here, aren't we? Well, how could you not be intimidated? Trust me, I'm intimidated by this goal as well. And I'm sure that this intimidated the original readers too. And I'm sure because of where Paul goes in the next verses, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He starts in chapter 2, verse 1 by saying, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. Well, thus far in our series, we've been talking about the church in Colossa and if we, if we want to be more accurate, we, we, we would do better to say churches. Not churches in the sense that there were multiple church buildings, but churches in the sense that there were at least two and probably three house churches. We discover this from, uh, from Colossians, but also from uh, Paul's letter to Philemon, which you can find in the New Testament, about six books of the Bible after Colossians. Philemon was a resident of Colossa. And we know that one of the house churches in Colossa met in Philemon's house. He was a wealthy businessman, and uh, a group of Christians were gathering in his home, consisting of a home church. Um, and there was probably at least one other home church in Colossa. And we know that there was at least one other church just up the road in the town of Laodicea. And that's what Paul is addressing here. He's including the Laodicean Christians as well. And almost certainly those believers met at the home of a woman whose name was Nympha. So we've got a number of Christian communities that are addressed in Colossians. And Paul wants them all to know that he cares about them and, and he's there to encourage them. 
And he's there to support them. And this continues as we read on in chapter 2. My goal is that they may become encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So again, this section that I just read, it's, it's full of Paul's encouragement for these believers who are part of these different house churches in and around Colossae. And he reassures them that in their pursuit of this goal of full maturity in Christ, they are absolutely not alone. They are absolutely not alone in this. Paul may be 2,100 kilometers removed from them. He's under house arrest in the city of Rome. He may be physically distanced from them, but he nevertheless is contending. He's struggling for them with everything that he is and with all that he's got. Daily, he's lifting them up in prayer. Daily, he's cheering them on in the faith. And he wants them to know that though he's physically absent, they can't convince themselves or be deceived by the message that he's absent from them in spirit, not even for a second, right? He's like, hey, I want you to know I'm, I'm right there with you and don't you dare doubt it, not even for a moment. Now, those of you who know the New Testament well will hear this as sort of an echo of what Jesus says to his disciples just before his return, his ascension to heaven, right? Matthew 28, verse 20 records Jesus saying to them, Surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And the way that Jesus is present with his followers today, the way he's present with you and me today, is through the presence of of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Now, there are numerous ways that you and I can grow toward full maturity in Christ. Uh, This church is there to assist you, those of you who want to continue growing toward full maturity in Christ. Of course, there's Bible reading, and not just reading the Bible, but reflecting on what we read, meditating, journaling what we read. There's uh, prayer, there's participation in small groups, There's service in Jesus' name. And there are a whole host of other ways that we can grow toward full maturity in Christ. But at this point, I want to highlight two ways that are worthy of further mention because they relate to the Holy Spirit. One is to intentionally tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can read about this throughout the New Testament. I'm thinking especially of Romans chapter 8, verse 11 and following. Are you tapped into the power of the Holy Spirit? Last summer we did a series and I illustrated how the Holy Spirit works in a believer's life using the analogy of a furnace. And I said, just as every Canadian home has a furnace, right? We need to heat our homes during our cold winters. So every Canadian home has a furnace. So too every person who's accepted Jesus as the forgiver of their sins and the leader of their lives has the Holy Spirit living in them. However, to really sense a furnace's power, you've got to have a pilot light that's lit. And a lot of believers are like, well, they're like a house with a furnace, but the pilot light isn't lit. There's no, there's no heat. There's no power in their Christian lives. To tap into the power of the Holy Spirit is, it's like having that furnace with the pilot light lit. The second way that we can grow toward full maturity in Christ as it comes to the Holy Spirit is to follow the impulses of the Holy Spirit. And that's also talked about in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 14. To tap into the impulses, the nudges, uh, the little ways that the Holy Spirit guides and directs Believers who are open to guidance and direction. Now, where both of these ways of growing are concerned, the the two that I mentioned that have to do with the Holy Spirit, 
One way that you can begin practicing both is to, is to start your day every day with a prayer something like this. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this new day. Thank you for the gift of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, help me live in your power today. Lead me and guide me. Lead my thoughts and my words and my actions. And help me to follow in obedience that God may be glorified and that others may be blessed. It's a simple prayer. And if you begin making that your daily prayer, then you're going to really sense that you are tapped into the Holy Spirit. And you're going to better be able to follow those impulses, those nudges, and the different direction that the Holy Spirit gives you. And now we arrive at not just the theme verses for uh, our morning, but really we come back to the theme verses for this entire series, uh, kind of like the core uh, verses of Colossians, and that's chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. So as I read this, this will be familiar to any of you who've been part of the series. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. What this is saying is that receiving Christ is one thing. It's the first uh, critical thing. It's a critical thing, but it's only the first thing. Once we've received Christ, once He's our Savior and Lord, then we're to continue to grow. We're to continue to mature in Him. And that's where that image of a mighty and mature oak tree that I've been using uh, throughout this series, that's where that image of a mature tree comes in. And now I want to address a question that one of you asked, and though this was asked by one of you, I'm certain that this is a question that's on the hearts of many of you. And it's a question that doesn't get addressed directly in our letter. It doesn't get addressed directly in Colossians, and I think there's a reason for it. It's because Paul is writing this church, or writing to a church that's maybe five years old. Like it's a young, young congregation. So they haven't had to deal with, um, you know, long-term believers and children of believers growing up and moving away from home. This question isn't addressed in Colossians, but thankfully uh, it's a question that gets addressed elsewhere in the Bible. In fact, many passages of the Bible shed light and give us an answer to this question. The question is this, What about our family, our friends, uh, our relatives who were planted in Christ? In other words, they were born or they were raised in uh, Christian households, homes where they were instructed in the Christian faith, homes where they would have developed some of those roots that we've been talking about and that Paul talks about here. What about family and relatives and friends who were born and raised as Christians but who at this point no longer attend church, who at this point don't seem to have roots. What about them? And this question addresses a sad but all too common phenomenon, and that is this, that sometimes people who have developed roots in Christ, instead of being built up, instead of growing stronger in their faith, they grow weaker and sometimes even lose their faith. Some of the roots, some of their roots get cut. Which begs the question, what's caused those roots to get cut? Well, not God. God has not cut those roots. In fact, any number of things may have cut those roots. Generally though, the things that cut people's roots of faith I would put into two categories, two main categories. Number one, a lot of those things that cut people's roots relate to disillusionment around the hardship and the trials and the loss and the suffering and the disappointments of life. During pandemic in particular, we know this, that life is hard even at the best of times. 
But when we go through an extended season of pain or when we experience multiple losses in a very short amount of time, it can be tough to keep the faith. Especially if you're a newer believer and you haven't had time to develop lots of roots. Um, or if you're a young adult, a young person. Life's losses and suffering and hardships cut a lot of roots for a lot of believers. That's the first category. And the second category of things that account for people's roots being cut, well, frankly, it's other Christians. Now, mostly this isn't done intentionally. Mostly it's done through thoughtlessness or carelessness. Like when Christians, when they disagree destructively or when they fight. Or when Christians say one thing and then do another thing, live a life of hypocrisy. Or when your family experiences a death and a Christian comes to the funeral and they flippantly write it off as, well, this was God's will. They say, well, this was God's will. Or when you identify as LGD, LGBTQ+, and you're told you're going to go to hell. Or when you're told about grace, but all you feel from other Christians is judgment. Judgment about how you dress, or judgment about the way that you worship, or judgment about how much you give or don't give to your church, or judgment around different church-made rules. Sad but true, sometimes Christians are the ones who cut our roots or the roots of people that we love. At any rate, roots can get cut. And River City, this should break our hearts. And it does break our hearts, especially when it's a beloved son or daughter or a beloved relative or a dear friend. So what about them? Is all hope lost? Absolutely not. And I can think of at least a few reasons why not. See, though we live in an individualistic society and an individualistic age, the Christian faith is anything but individualistic. Even in our passage today, we see Paul contending, seriously struggling and strenuously contending for the believers in and around Colossa. So these believers weren't alone in their battles. They weren't alone in their struggles. Paul, the apostle, was battling with them and for them, as was Epaphras, right? The planter of that church. And if you read uh, Colossians chapter 4, you'll see other leaders that are identified and mentioned who were contending for members of those house churches. Which means that in addition to every believer belonging to a biological family, every believer belongs or should belong to a church community, an extended uh, church community, a faith family that contends with you and for you. River City, we're to contend for one another on this team. And I've seen this at work many times at River City, most especially and most clearly when it comes to my two adult children, to Eric and Allie. I can list many, many people in our church community who have shown concern for my kids, who've expressed care and compassion for my kids, who've encouraged my kids, prayed for them, and even prayed with them. Some of the names would include Sean and Tina and Tina, and Nicole, AJ, Narima, Julie, James, Juliet, Melissa, Phil, Pam, and many more besides. So as much as Christians are sometimes guilty of cutting other Christians' roots, Christians also, thankfully, contend for one another. This is how the body of Christ is supposed to work. It's how the church is supposed to function. What's more, the Holy Spirit contends for them. 
The Holy Spirit contends for these people. I, I use the analogy of a furnace and a pilot light, but guess what? If you've got the Holy Spirit in you, even if the pilot light isn't lit, doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is powerless to work. That's a repeated theme in the New Testament. Another repeated theme that is of tremendous encouragement, or should be, another repeated theme in both the Old and the New Testaments is that God is faithful. And God can hold us and our loved ones even if we or they fall. He remains faithful even if we are faithless. Even if we or our children or our friends or our loved ones are faithless. Indeed, if our experiences of God's promises were based on our faithfulness, <laughs> we would all we would all be sunk. But thank God that's not the case. Listen to how Paul encouraged another young church. This is the church in Corinth. And if you think Colossa had its problems, and it did, the church in Corinth had, well, it made Colossian problems look small. That's how bad they were. But listen to how, listen to how Paul addresses them in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He, that is God, will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this, for He is faithful to do what He says. And He has invited you into partnership with His Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. So God is faithful. Did you hear it? Do you see it on the screen? And He never stops working. And because God never stops working in our lives or in the lives of those we love, we never have reason to give up hope. We have never any reason to stop persevering in prayer. We have never reason to stop our faith or to stop believing. In fact, we believe for those family and friends who've been hurt or are hurting. And this is illustrated most powerfully in the true story of Monica. Have you heard about Monica? I've got to tell you about Monica. True story from the 4th century. Monica was Augustine's mother, and she was a devout, devout believer, follower of Christ. She raised her son Augustine to be a devout believer as well, and yet already as a youth, right? Already as a young person, Augustine rebelled and he resisted the Christian faith until he outright rejected it. Well, you can imagine how this mother heart was weighed down by this, especially when Augustine moved far, far from home and pursued a life of pleasure and all the rest. But though it weighed heavily on Monica's heart, she never lost hope, never lost faith, continued to lift her son and her unbelieving husband up to God through daily prayer. And after 17 years of resistance, Augustine converted to Christianity. In fact, you might know him better by the name that history has accorded him, which is St. Augustine, because he went on for the rest of his life to become one of the best theologians and one of the most impactful people in church history, period. And Monica's extended period of long suffering for her son, well, it was almost twice eclipsed by her long suffering for her unbelieving husband, whom she prayed for for some 30 years before he converted to Christianity. Remember, we live in a microwave world. But where our spiritual growth is concerned, well, it's more slow cooker. It's more like that crock pot that I showed you. And where God's working in the lives of our loved ones, our children, our beloved relatives, our friends, well, it's more slow cooker there too. Nevertheless, God is working. God is working. He's working when there's outward evidence that he's at work and there's, he's working even when there's no evidence whatsoever. Well, there's so much more I'd love to share with you today, but let's leave it at that. Uh, if you consider yourself a Christ follower, as I do, then let's make uh, growth toward complete, 
full maturity in Christ, our lifelong goal. Let's make that our objective. We do this as an act of obedience. We do this because it honors God. We do this as an expression of thanks and thanksgiving to Jesus, our Savior. And we do this because others are contending for us. And we do this because in a world such as ours with so much suffering and loss and hardship and pain, in a world such as this, Lord knows, we need all the mature Christ-like people possible. Amen? Amen. Good morning, River City. James Carroll here, your friendly treasurer. I want to thank all of you who heard our call for financial support in December. As you may remember, we were running a deficit of about $12,000 due to a drop in donations as we dealt with the pandemic restrictions. Today, I want to give you a quick update as to where we stand as of January. The good news is, because you answered the call, we've come close to closing the gap in our budget. In fact, we're a few thousand dollars off from being on track to our previous plans. On behalf of the RCC board and RCC staff, I want to thank you as your sustained giving will allow us to execute our plans and have a larger impact reaching more people across Cambridge. However, we still need your sustained support to get into and stay in the black. So I continue to ask that you remember us each month and contribute on a consistent basis. Now, it is coming up to tax season, and many of you will have already received your charitable giving statements. If you haven't received yours yet, especially if you're new to giving and maybe use the e-transfer process, please email finance at rivercitychurch.org with your name, mailing address, and phone number so we can be sure that we have all the right information to get those records to you. Hope to see all of you again very, very soon. Have a great day. Well, thank you to James Carroll for updating us regarding our finances and just giving us that wee bit of evidence that God is for us. He's not against us. He wants to give us a hope and a future. And let's just continue with faith through these difficult times. A couple of weeks ago, we had a forum for engagement and I was so pleased to have about nine people show up on Zoom to talk about community engagement and how to do that in these unusual times. And so because of that event, two events of our past are coming back in a new form on Zoom. And that includes our dessert night for the women and for the men, it's the wings night. And so Sunday, February 21st, women get your dessert ready uh, or buy ready-made stuff, if you will, and join us for a Zoom dessert night. And guys, on February 26th, that's a Friday, get your wings and whatever other thing that you might have with your wings ready, and you guys can have some conversation as well. I think the women will chat much more than you will, but maybe you can tell us a different tale about that after the fact. Okay, so that's about it for today. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. We're continuing with Rooted and Built Up and next week is Valentine's Day. Hmm. Don't forget to do something special for your special someone in your life. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.